So welcome everyone um, to the second event in our series to celebrate 25 years um, of the Carpentries. Um, so for those of you who are not here for our first event, um, we wanted to reshare a picture from the first Carpentries workshop that was led by our co-founders, Greg Wilson and Brent Gorda from 1998. So that was 25 years ago. Um, since we started recording our numbers in 2012 and as of the end of 2022, um, the Carpentries has supported over 4,000 workshops in 65 countries and trained 4,287 volunteer instructors. Um, today's event is the second in a series to celebrate these collective achievements. Um, so we are spotlighting different parts of the world each month where the Carpentries has spread since that, since that first workshop in 1998. Um, so today we are featuring our sub-communities in New Zealand and Australia. Our next event will be September 28th um, at 10 a.m. UTC when we will be highlighting our sub-communities in Africa. Um, the final three have not yet been scheduled, but we will be spotlighting Lat um, Latin America in October, Europe, Canada, and the U.S. in November, and Asia in December. Um, to be notified when these events are scheduled, we ask that you register for the entire series, if you have not already, um, at the link that Erin will share in the chat. Um, other than joining this and future events and eating a lot of cake, um, there are many ways you can engage in celebrating um, this milestone with us. Um, so we are using the hashtag Carpentries25 when posting to our social media channels, and we are also seeking video and written testimonials. Um, so you, if, or a, if you or a colleague have a story to tell um, about your time in the community, we would love um, to connect with you. Um, I know our guest will speak some to the origin of the Carpentries in Australia and New Zealand, um, but I wanted to give us um, get us started with sharing some photos. Uh, so the first workshop in this part of the world was hosted on um, February 23rd or 2013 at um, Macquarie University um, in Australia. Um, this was followed by additional workshops. Um, the first photo is from the first ever workshop in Brisbane that was held in conjunction with the PyCon Australia Conference um, in July of 2014. And the second photo is from a workshop hosted in Auckland in that same year. Um, the first instructor training event um, where this photo was taken was held at the inaugural Research Bazaar at the University of Melbourne um, in 2015. And Damien, one of our guests today, actually informed me that this event was also the first instructor training that Greg Wilson, who is our co-founder, did not attend and that he was um, actually pretty nervous, <laughs> pretty nervous about that. Um, but the first instructor training event in New Zealand was hosted in Auckland um, uh, the following year in February 2016. And these events have continued in person and online for the past decade. So since that first workshop um, in 2013, um, within just these two countries, there have been 417 workshops supported by 436 certified instructors who are trained by 20 instructor trainers. So very impressive. Um, so I wanna introduce you to our guest for today. Um, Liz Stokes um, joined the skilled workforce development team at the Australian Research Data Commons in 2018 and supports research trainer communities. Based in Sydney, um, they are a Carpentries trainer and coordinate a consortium membership um, representing research organizations across Australia. They also coordinate a regional network of ResBaz organizing teams, a community skill sharing initiative which grew out of engagement with the Carpentries. Welcome, Liz. Um, next, we have Murray um, Kadzow. Murray is a scientific programmer within research teaching IT support at the University of Otago. Um, prior to this, he spent 11 years researching the genetic basis of gout and related diseases. Murray has been heavily involved in computational literacy and bioinformatic training at the university, organizing research bazaar, um, Dunedin and the Otago Bioinformatics Spring School. He is both a Carpentries instructor and instructor trainer. His teaching has focused on delivering digital literacy training to researchers and the development and support of the local Carpentries community. So welcome, Murray. 
And next we have Damian Irving. Um, Damian is a climate data scientist at CERO in Australia. He got involved in the Carpentries as a PhD student back in 2013 when he helped organize funding for Greg Wilson to fly down to Sydney and Melbourne to deliver the first software carpentry workshop outside of Europe and North America. Um, ever since, he's been an active instructor, lesson maintainer, and regional coordinator for, for Australia. So welcome, Damian. Um, next, we have Amanda um, Miyoto. Amanda is an e-research um, analysis for Griffith University with 14 years in the industry. She started off in the field of bioinformatics and learned to appreciate the beauty of science before discovering the joys of coding. Um, she aims to bring ideas and resources to researchers previously unavailable to accelerate their projects and believe in empowering researchers through knowledge. She is one of the inaugural Brisbane um, Carpentry and ResBaz team and launched Griffith University's Hacky Hour, sharing her learning through a GitHub repository that I've actually linked to in that etherpad that we shared with you earlier. Um, so welcome, Amanda. Um, we also have um, Nisha Gotok. Nisha is a training lead at New Zealand eScience Infrastructure. She's a Carpentries Regional Coordinator in New Zealand and a member of the Executive Council for the Carpentries. So welcome, Nisha. And then finally, we have um, Daria Vanichkina. Daria is a data scientist consultant and training coordinator at the University of Sydney's Informatics Hub. Um, she loves working with clients to make data-driven decisions from project design to analytics and programming to communication and visualization. She leads a program that has equipped over 3,000 learners with digital skills via training colleagues in pedagogy best practices, as well as course development and delivery. Daria is a senior fellow of the UK Higher Educational Academy and holds a grad certificate in higher education education teaching, is a Carpentries instructor and instructor trainer, and is actively involved with the Sydney Research Bazaar. Um, so welcome, Daria, and thanks to all of you for being with us today. I am going to stop sharing my screen, and I am going to get us started with some questions. So um, the first question is uh, for Damien. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the origins of the Carpentries Down Under? Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks for hosting. Um, yeah, I mean, those those first couple of workshops in February in 2013 in Sydney and Melbourne came about. Basically, I was a I was a PhD student in like 2012, just Googling around looking for help with Python that had become like, you know, the trendy programming language in climate science. And I, you know, stumbled upon the, the software carpentry materials and filled out the request form for a workshop. And then Greg Wilson got back in touch with me and said, oh, um, Josh Madden from Macquarie University has also been asking about a workshop. Um, he, he'd actually been in the US in 2012 and had been to one of Greg's workshops. And he basically said, well, if you can get some money together to fly me down there and you know pay for a hotel, um, I'll, I'll run some workshops for you. So um, we, we managed to get the money together and, and down he came. And um, in the testimonial I wrote, some people might have seen on the blog, I kind of talk about after that first workshop, the one in Melbourne, Greg's like very, very excited about the potential in Australia and talking about, you know, me and others becoming instructors and we're going to grow the thing across the country. And and I, I thought he was completely nuts, to be honest. Like I, I'd only just learned, you know, how to use Git that day. Like I was just like, sure, sure, Greg, you seem a very enthusiastic and lovely man, but that seems crazy. Um, but in the months after that, some of us who were involved in those first workshops did the, you know, did the online instructor training course with Greg and then um, workshops kind of started to pop up around the place and then um i talk about in the post david flanders a, a really kind of innovative guy at melbourne uni um who led the kind of outreach and training part of the it department there for a few, number of years um basically hired phd students like me and others who were you know really interested in coding as well as our research to to basically just run carpentries workshops and stuff and so we had volunteer effort going on around the country but then also this dedicated like paid effort in melbourne um, and that culminated in that first um, research bazaar event that you showed the, the photo of where we got money together on the, so the research bazaar is basically like a bunch of, if you ran a whole bunch of carpentry workshops at the same time um, over a few day period and put a big social program around it to make it more fun and social and things. Um, and we got money to bring like um, people who would train up as instructors um, to Melbourne for the two days prior to that ResBaz and basically train them up. Um, so from every capital city in Australia, from a bunch of the bigger cities in New Zealand, they all came um, to Melbourne for that. And then a lot of them stayed and then actually taught the course, the courses at ResBaz. 
Um, and so that really, really um, got things going. So that everyone just went home to their home cities and started running workshops and it it all kind of grew from there. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And I, I often think back on that first conversation with Greg and I, just how how right he was and how crazy I thought he was. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, it's kind of It's kind of funny. Great. Thanks so much, Damien. I love seeing that picture of Greg too um, from that from that first workshop. Um, uh, but for Anisha and Liz, I wanted to ask both of you, um, from your perspective working um, at uh, Nessie and ARDC, could you tell us a little bit about how things have grown um, in New Zealand um, for you, Anisha, and Australia for you, Liz, um, since those early days and where things are at today? So we'll have you start, Nisha. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Um, so Nessie's initiation into the Carpentries world was in 2013 at um, the eResearch New Zealand conference in Christchurch. And then this was followed by the first instructor training uh, session hosted at ResBas Melbourne that Damien just mentioned. So um, so I could spot some of the people like Mick, who's on this call, and Nick. Um, I could spot them in that picture <laughs> that Damien had shared. Um, so this was definitely well before my time at Nessie or the Carpentries, uh, but um, I think that experience de definitely um, um, gave us a bit of a push and uh, it was followed by a series of training workshops um, uh, in New Zealand and various organizations and uh, I think by 2015, um, several universities um, and um, had started wanting to be involved in the software carpentry workshops and they wanted there was a demand for it and that was recognized um and uh, nessie basically began supporting the instructor training efforts as well soon after that so um and that has been a huge motivation to empower researchers who require hands-on training uh, ever since so uh, i think uh carpentry's workshops in new zealand have helped establish a network of researchers with shared computational and data science interests. So um, yeah, I think regarding the changes over time, uh, I think at the beginning we were more focused on the core curriculum, but over time the value of the pedagogy and the workshop approaches have been applied to different uh, kinds of research spaces um, and have sort of branched out, <laughs> I think. So um, yeah, and there are just so many amazing workshops being hosted by New Zealand based organizations at the moment. Um, I mean, we've got Genomics Aotearoa, who Nessie often partners with to provide genomics training. And um, we've got Center for E-Research at University of Auckland, uh, University of Otago, where Murray leads most of the training that happens there. Uh, there's University of Canterbury, University of Victoria, Wellington. And, and these, these are just to name a few. There are a few more who do Carpentries workshops, but I think, um, I think Mari will talk a bit more about uh, the software carpentry sessions that we've recently piloted. So things, um, uh, and, and to pick, to do that nationally. So that was a national effort on our part to facilitate such an effort. So yeah, I think it has changed quite a bit in branching out. <laughs> so, but there's definite interest and there's definite de man, uh, demand for it still. So yeah. Great, thanks so much, Nisa, Nisha. Um, Liz, do you want to um, respond for Australia? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'll start with myself and, and go out from there. And my first experience with um, library carpentry, actually, it was library carpentry. I was switching to a data librarian job at UTS and joining the, there was a Latin, which is libraries of the Australian Techno universities of technology sponsored library data carpentry workshop there and later when I joined the ARDC one of my first representative roles with the carpentries was on the library carpentry advisory group which I ended up chairing for a couple of years with Ariel and later Anajiat and that's that's still a fire in my belly um, that what carpentries teach is relevant to those doing research support as well as the researchers but on in terms of the Australian um, research data commons and our consortium that we lead um, in 2021, my colleague Matthias Lippers here and I reached out to the Australian community about a consortium membership um, for three, three key reasons. Firstly, to um, uh, do local coordination in order to renew and grow the um, instructor community. Also to encourage collaboration between institutions and broker those relationships. 
and also to build capacity for research, digital research skills among Australian researchers, as well as the service providers training people in infrastructure. So today our partnership has sent over 100 people registered for uh, instructor training. We've had the major training organisations backing us, that's QCIF uh, in Queensland and Intersect, and universities from east to west um, being part of our partnership. What I'm really excited about are the new kids on the block, like the Burnett Institute and AIMS, the um, uh, Institute of Marine Science, taking up this opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, and I want to ask you, so the Carpentries community um, in Brisbane has been uh, incredibly active over the years. So what's been the secret um, to sustaining such an active community? I think a large chunk of it is the fact that there's such a need for it here. Like I know our very first carpentry, we were expecting maybe 20 people and I think we had 80 people sign up. Um, and I know through the years, I've done carpentry both at Grit for Griffith University and then later on through QCIV. I think I booked out, we booked out most Python workshops within a couple of days for a long time at Griffith. Um, I think it's also a case where, um, firstly, you have to really respect your volunteers' time and hope, hopefully they get something out of it as well. Whether we get supervisors in who had a couple of students in, whether it was people who are looking to expand their resume and their skill set a little bit more. Um, but I think as well, it's important I know at least, especially when we were at Griffith and later on for QCIF as well, we had a lot of paid staff running them because it made a lot of sense for the university itself. Um, so for example, if we train people up how to code, they were processing more data, they were getting more use out of the HVC. It was also, especially when we are in person, it gave us a really good opportunity to meet people and find out about what they were doing and get some face-to-face -face time with research directly. And even um, doing it in a way that it was cross-institutional, it gave researchers to meet the person who's next to them and have a conversation about what they were doing. So you were getting a little bit of networking happening as well as a bit of an incidental. Um, I think as well, uh, we were really lucky in that, um, especially in the beginning, we got a fair bit of higher up um, buy-in. And I think it's important to show the benefits of that, which sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, in terms of showing like, you know, the stats of how many people turn up is obviously a really easy one to provide. Trying to show the long-term benefit can be a little bit trickier, but I know, for example, when we were as part of QCIF, we would do impact statements to say, all right, you know, we helped this group, they got this benefit out of it, which was really useful as well. And we were doing that not just with carpentry stuff, but wider as well. So I think it is just a case of we've been really, there's been a huge need there, but people have also really seen the benefits as well. And we have had a fair bit of buy-in, so we're, we've been able to run some of it in staff time and stuff like that. So yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I know a lot of um, impact is being shared too. As part of this anniversary event, a lot of people have been sharing testimonials um, and, and writing about the impact the organization has had on them personally. So that's been really great to, um, uh, great to see. Um, the next question I have is for um, both Murray um, and Daria. Uh, but the success of the Carpentries depends a lot on a thriving and well-trained community of instructors. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about your experiences training up instructors um, in New Zealand um, for you, Murray, and then Australia for you, um, Daria. Um, and we'll have you go first, Murray. Cool. Um, yeah, so New Zealand has been pretty self-sufficient, I think, since um, the instructor training regime sort of got fed out a bit um, more globally. Um, so 2018 was when I did my trainer training. Um, and from there, we've had sort of three or four um, trainers around New Zealand. Um, and we've largely run like in-person events. And the thing that's really cool about the in-person stuff, especially in a country like New Zealand, is that we're fairly small, but we also have a lot of um, networks and cross-institutional um, collaborations. And just the, the opportunity to get together a whole bunch of people that are like-minded um, with a real enthusiasm for training people, um, especially in like digital literacy, um, that's been a really fun um, and rewarding aspect of training people in um, New Zealand. And it's also cool to see the, the networks that the instructors get to build within like the, the country plus uh, within their own 
organizations and seeing them come through um, and begin to run training that starts off with carpentries and then ends up often migrating off into other training programs. So that's been really cool. Great, thank you, Murray. Um, Daria. Thank you. It's actually really good to follow along with Murray because in Australia, we've had a mix actually of online training and in-person training of instructors. And I think that's been um, like, obviously it's very different, the two formats, but I think both of them are really helpful in a large geographically time zone dispersed country like Australia, where we've got instructors literally across the country and we need them in very different, like again, in different places, different time zones. And I think for me, instructor training online or in person is really about building community. Like that is the primary way in which we build that community because an instructor can then go out and start building community around them and really supporting the national community. And I think I'm actually really, really happy that Belinda's on this call because for me, like instructor training started with when I was trained and this was when Belinda and I were attending Greg's online training from the US. And I remember like, for me, the epitome of it was, I remember her calling me one day at 5 a.m. because time zones had changed and it was at five and I did not realize that. <laughs> and I was like, she's calling me, I'm like, my normal phone, like it's on, I'm like, oh my God. So that to me, that kind of a connection encapsulates what we're trying to do. A lot of what we're trying to do with instructor training, because yes, it's about teaching people pedagogy. And I'll talk about that in a second, but a lot of it really is about building that community of like-minded individuals who are interested in sharing their skills. Technical, yes, but also um, uh, training and support and just really valuing empowering others. And I think, um, in terms of training itself, it's a, it's a very strange place to work because as was um, alluded to in my introduction, I've had a lot of, I've done like a grad in higher education, I'm a senior fellow at UK Higher Education Academy. I've done a lot of training and teaching around teaching at a university in a sort of a classical university context. And what's different and special about uh, the digital skills training that we deliver through the Carpentries is that this isn't something where we've got a summative assessment, like an exam or something where we're gonna give people a mark. And they have not, and like I've asked individuals, they're not interested in that. That's not what they're there for. They're really there just to learn. So the attitudes, like the way we support motivation and the kind of motivation we have, the way we support, again, set, the way we do assessment, the way we help people check in with what they've learned, versus you know, a formal exam where you're like, oh, here's the ranking. Like that type of teaching is a really different space to operate in. It's a very positive space because if people aren't motivated, they're not gonna come to your class. But it's also a really um, powerful space to work in where we don't quite know what the best ways of doing it are. So there's a lot of room experimentation and discussion and reflective practice. So I've really loved being a part of that, growing that type of a teaching environment, which is like, again, different to what you'd normally get exposed to in uni. And I think, yeah, that's, that's where the carpet really shines and getting recognized for debt and getting recognized for that value. I think that's where we're going to next. Thank you. Great, thank you all so much. And maybe we might hear from Belinda a little bit later too. I don't wanna put you on the spot, Belinda. Um, uh, but we do have um, another question. Just as a reminder, um, feel free to ask any questions that you have for the panel um, into the etherpad. Um, but I did want to ask you all that um, you've all played kind of a big role in growing the carpentries um, in the region over the past decade. Um, what would you consider to be the biggest success you have witnessed um, over that time? What kind of left you inspired? And you can unmute yourself or raise your hand, whichever you would like, if you'd like to respond. I mean, I can have a bit of a go if you want Alicia I mean I think I think the consortium's been a big deal I think I think it was I always because I've kind of been involved since the beginning it was hard for me to see how kind of like organizations would get involved like it was very expensive if you wanted a membership just as a single organization and like how is that ever really going to happen and like and the consortium model of just the ARDC kind of coordinates it and then it, the, all these different organizations can just pay a little bit of money instead of a lot of money because they just need to, you know, maybe get trained up a couple of instructors in their institution, not like tens of instructors. <laughs> like, and so I think that's a real game changer. Just, it's just, it's a low bar for organizations to get involved, but it's a formal enough thing that, you know, they, they can send people along to instructor training. Those people can come back to their organization and teach things. So 
I think with the the Burnett Institute and Ames and smaller organizations like that getting on board, I, I think, yeah, I just for a long time I just thought, how's this actually going to work? And then now that the consortium's here, it's like, ah, oh, this 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 could actually work. So that I think that's an exciting development. Thanks, Dame. Oh, thanks, Damian. Um, Liz. Oh, thank you. Um, I think Belinda and Daria had their hands up first, and I'm very happy to defer. Thanks for noticing that. I um, was looking at the etherpad for a second there, so I missed that. Um, go ahead, Belinda. Okay. Oh, I'll, write, I'll lower my hand a minute as well. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I guess one of the things I'd like to say is how much difference one person can make. Um, software carpentry really got started in Brisbane in 2015 after Amanda Areej, Paula Sam and Mitch Stanton Cook went to ResBaz in Melbourne and got trained um, and I somehow got in touch with Damien and we ran our first workshop um, in, maybe in 2016 and I think in that year we taught 14 workshops at UQ or maybe it was the next year but you know I just really got my elbow to the wheel and so did the other people and we just taught workshop after workshop after workshop and people who came to workshops want to teach workshops. So then they want to become instructors. So, you know, it just really kind of fanned out from there. And then Sam Haynes and I at UQ wanted to replicate the success Amanda had had with Hacky Hour at um, Griffith, where you kind of pick up people after uh, a workshop because they're a bit stuck and help them go on. And, you know, Hacky Hour started out with just me and one PhD student. And, you know, then it grew into this sort of self-sustaining thing. And, so, you know, you think, oh, what can one person do? A one person can do an enormous lot. So I did carpentry, I did software carpentry, then I did library carpentry, and I went around the world teaching that. So, you know, you can just make this big ripple effect. So don't think that one person can't move, move mountains. You can. Thanks, Belinda. That's such a great, um, great uh, thing to share. Um, Daria, would you like to go next? I, I'm actually really happy to follow on from Belinda because for me, the most inspiring thing is actually seeing attendees become instructors and start becoming members of community and start becoming active in that. Because for me as a, a but it really as a community member, I don't like instructor training is just one hat. It's But as a community member, it is so empowering to see people that come in maybe as an attendee and go, oh, wow, okay, maybe I know enough of this to stand up and teach. Like Damien said, no one, I have, I have yet to meet someone who's like, yes, I absolutely know everything. I was like, I'm not sure I can do this. And you're like, yes, you can. And then people go off and do these amazing things. So seeing the success of that, because again, I started out with actually in Brisbane as Belinda was starting out as well. I came to the first Brisbane workshop, became an instructor, and then I moved down to Sydney. And so we started growing the Sydney community after I had like branched off from Brisbane and met other people here in Sydney who had seen Melbourne or like other cities. So it was really like that, that, that empowering people. That's really what inspires me. Like that's, watching people grow and develop and just, yeah, that. Thanks, Daria. Um, Liz. Yeah, I wanted to share a few, um, highlight a few examples of what is inspirational. And it's all about people who are taking the opportunity and running with it. So it's like my colleague Paula Martinez translating her community management experience through the Carpentries to transform research software community in Australia and internationally, actually. Kami Cronje, who is um, building community in the um, CSIRO Data Schools Academy. Belinda Weaver here today teaching librarians to get over themselves and try something new. Patty Virtue, a shout out to an, um, a training coordinator um, from ACES, which is the Antarctic Climate Science Centre, reaching out to Damien in literally a corridor and bringing in new instructors as helpers on a workshop um, that has facilitated new opportunities for workshops this year. So it's about seeing those, um, those things grow from these opportunities. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, Murray. Yeah, so at a personal level as an instructor, I think one of the most inspirational things is that by the end of the workshop, you've seen people go from potentially zero to a I can do this attitude. Um, but in the wider context as well, I think success um, looking nationally, I think it's quite amazing to have seen Nessie as an umbrella organization sort of 
nurturing the carpentries within New Zealand, um, and then that the memberships sort of growing from like other institutions deciding to take on their own memberships because that's a thing that they now want to embed within their institution um, and seeing it rolled out as part of like the foundational pedagogy for training programs. So Genomics Aotearoa, the carpentry's pedagogy underpins all of the workshops that they roll out. Um, so just seeing it incorporated now as like the way of delivering a lot of this training is very inspirational, I think. I'm loving all of these stories. This is wonderful. Um, Nisha. Yeah, I love that I go last because I've heard all these wonderful stories and I agree and I resonate all the feelings that were shared just now. Uh, I I do agree with what Murray said and it's 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 lovely to see that there is, um, that people recognize the kind of efforts that actually go into being a part of the carpentries world and what what would it, what does it mean to be part of this world and what can we exactly get from this um, you know, this partnership. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I'm pretty new to all of this. And there have been my predecessors, uh, people within this community in New Zealand and my organization. They've all done so much work that has gone into this. And I just came in and <laughs> um, got the best of it, I guess. Um, but I, I do want to flag that it was really, really fascinating to see that Nessie has um has supported over 61 instructor training attendees so you know they've they've actually seen through the trainings of over 61 people just within new zealand and new zealand is tiny so <laughs> 61 uh, or just about 61 is, is is a huge number for us and it hasn't been that long that we became uh, a platinum partner so um platinum member and the other thing that happened just within this one year has been that um all the amount of work that Mick, Murray, and Arun put into as the three current active instructor trainer trainers in New Zealand, they um, they have been so supportive of letting these uh, trainees know that come along to the workshops that are coming up. Just come, and we will help you get onboarded. We'll get you used to teaching. And post COVID, it has been such a challenge to teach online because it's not. For those of us who have taught, we know that it's easier to teach in the classroom than it is to a an online Zoom room where people probably switch off their cameras and <laughs> mute their microphones and you don't know what they're thinking. So um, it has been wonderful and it has been great to let these, uh, and to also see that these uh, attendees, these newly minted instructor trainers are so interested and keen to be part of um, uh, workshops so they actually come to us they've come to us and say said that yeah we would love to help out with the workshop and that I think is what we want to do and that remains a challenge but that is what we want to hopefully achieve in larger numbers over the next few months or years and um, have people actually get onboarded and actually upskill and build the community as they go and it won't the onus won't be on the few of us who do it as members or as, as instructor trainers. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Nisha. Um, we actually had a question um, come into the etherpad. I'm adding it into the chat. Um, but what lessons um, have you learned that communities and other regions could learn from over your time with the Carpentries? Uh, Murray. I'll take the easy one. I think one of the biggest things that sort of differentiated the carpentries from many other training workshops and things was the code of conduct um, and just the upfront, we're here to have an inclusive environment. Um, everybody's here to learn. Um, that to me, I think, made us stand out just massively from many of the other training things. And I think many other organizations and things have seen how successful that is and are now it's now embedding itself. So that's that's my one. Thanks, Murray. Um, Daria. So I think that for us um, within Australia, it really was a game changer for the consortium idea. So that was something that wasn't there in other countries and other regions. Um, but really made a difference for us because 
unlike I guess the US and maybe some parts of Europe where there's really a lot of universities, like a lot of universities and a very large number of cities. Um, it's very, um, very distributed. In Australia, we actually have a lot of major like cities that have several universities and then there's not much else. So having consortium model allows us to really build that local community because um, it's all well and good to have one instructor, let's say, or two instructors in a place like Canberra, but that's really not sustainable for the long term because one or two people cannot get that community going and they can't necessarily call someone in from Perth because it ends up being too expensive to fly them out. So really having um, a consortium model where we can specifically target like, okay, we are going like, and this is again something the RDC has really been behind and like served as our platform for organizing. I really want to give a shout out to them for doing this going, okay, this time we're going to prioritize Canberra and we're going to have six people trained up in Canberra. So then they can combine with each other and then run something in Canberra. So I think that um, localized community building model has really helped us. And yes, all of these people will still attend the international talk, the community calls, the sort of the international carpentries, they will be a part of that. But in order to make it work on the ground, we really do need that targeted local approach. Um, and when we got when we got that through the consortium, that's what really made the big difference for us. Great, thank you so much, Daria. And we have um, been uh, supporting our um, local sub communities too through the community development program to provide a space for you all to share what's working in these various locations, um, uh, so that you can all build on each other's efforts. So that's really great to hear. Um, Nisha, did you still have your hand up? I did, and then okay. I thought maybe I shouldn't because it, it, was, it was, I mean, Daria, I, I, agree, I completely agree with what Daria said, and it was, my, my thoughts were on the same lines as hers, because I I was just about to say that uh, New Zealand, despite being a smaller country than Australia, we, we uh, have been consciously trying to make sure that when we, we, when we send out expressions like calls for applications for uh, instructor training, we want to make sure that um, candidates from um, parts of New Zealand that don't often get recognized, like uh, Palmerston North or Christchurch. We have not had too many candidates coming up from those regions um, going through instructor training. So we, we try to make sure and we consciously make sure that they know that there is an opportunity for them to be prioritized first. Um, just, yeah, just doing something like that as a conscious effort has worked out well in the past few years. I've seen that the numbers have gone up since uh, we began doing this, so yeah. Thanks so much, Nisha. Um, Belinda. I think it can also help to actually tap people on the shoulder and invite them. I mean, when Greg Wilson and I had never met, when he reached out to me on Twitter and suggested I become an instructor trainer, uh, instructor, and I said, oh, but Greg, I don't know anything. And he said, great, you'll be perfect. <laughs> which was actually true. You know, at first I found it so hard, but I definitely had that beginner mindset that I could really empathise with people. But, you know, I would never have thought of putting myself forward if I hadn't been kind of strong-armed into it a bit by Greg. So I think if you spot someone who likes to help people or who's very good at communicating ideas, um, just see if they would be interested because quite often people just are too shy to put themselves forward or they have never thought about it. But, you know, they do like to volunteer. They're often the person helping someone else with an assignment or something like that or, with, you know, their research. So I think that can really work. Thank you, Belinda. Um, I have another question. Um, I'm going to add it into the chat. Um, but we asked earlier about successes um, that you all have witnessed. What do you consider to be um, some of the biggest challenges the Carpentries has faced or um, continues to face right now in the region? Well, I, I want to say lots of people have said really nice things about the national coordination model. And I want to say that working out what level of national coordination actually works is still a big challenge. And um, I, I don't think we've solved that yet. It could be the, um, you know, ridiculous perfectionist in the back of my mind. But um, learning how to manage uh, different institutional stakeholders as 
and and learn what message they need to hear, which is very different from the community message that inspires people to get involved in the carpentries has been a big learning curve for me. Um, Damien. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like that we have lots of coordination now and like all that really excites me, but I guess the one thing that's different or maybe is on the decline is is more of the kind of spontaneous workshops that are just run by you know um people who who aren't linked to a partner organization or something like that do you know what i mean like more just they're just a computing nerd in whatever field they're in and and they they want to do carbon like yeah less of there's less of that kind of volu purely voluntary spontaneous stuff and i don't that you're never going to get, I guess, a large amount of volume from that. So I'm happy that there's so much centrally institutionally supported stuff. I think that's the, the most important thing, but I do sometimes wonder, I, I feel like some of that spontaneous random people doing workshops and stuff has gone away a little bit. Yeah. Um, Daria. Thank you. So I think for me, one of the biggest challenges is really around funding models and sort of sustainability. Um, and the reason for this is as I progressed in my career and sort of started building a career in this space, I've really seen a, a, around how what Damien is alluding to, which is great, where like, you know, there's a really enthusiastic PhD student or um, technical person sitting in a faculty and they're like, I want to run a workshop. I'm going to do it pro bono for free. It's great. The challenge that I've seen is that then that becomes the model that universities and other research organizations start to expect for providing this core skill that, as was acknowledged, I think, in the blurb, is now a requirement for a degree. So we have this tension between pretty much most research students now need some form of this, let's call it digital literacy, digital skills, and yet there is this reliance on a workforce which is not necessarily like volunteer run, paid, like unpaid. And that's not sustainable. That's just not sustainable because that PhD student doesn't necessarily get um, the, like the cost benefit doesn't necessarily work out to um, make make it make it work, make it work long term. Because you can run it once, you can run it twice, but at the end of the day, you need to graduate and you need to get papers, and that's what gets going to get you that next job if you're pursuing the academic career track. So uh, I really think that the challenge is figuring out how we provide funding for and recognition of training as a paid activity. Um, we can look at towards industry um, as how it can be done. Um, again, we don't necessarily have the funding that industry does to do this, but really in industry, something like what we run for free or for very low cost to researchers costs literally $1,500, $2,000 per day per attendee. Like that, we have run training um, for our commercial partners at a site. And that's about what we're kind of, they're like expecting us to charge that because that's what they think it costs. So the way we're doing this within the university and research setting, like that's, it's great. But if we want to scale this up and really make this sustainable in the longer term, I think we need to explore different models of funding for training where we actually pay the person running the training. We recognize excellence. We recognize the value that we, they deliver through the currently most accepted means, which is funding. So I think that for me, like funding and related sustainability aspects are the biggest question for the next decade, probably. Thanks, Daria. Um, Amanda, who has a little one yeah. <laughs> on her lap. <laughs> I'm trying to distract him at the moment. Um, I know, that's great. So following up from that as well, one thing that I said even when we first started doing carpentries is and, uh, and you had a really good point of, you know, this is now skills that are, should be expected. You know, if you believe a PhD, you should have that data analysis skills. I always was hoping that these skills, like the carpentries, for example, at Griffith, would become obsolete because they should be already putting this into what, into people's PhD, into their bachelor's degree. And I've got them, and it's definitely, there's that balance of, providing that service while you need it versus actually encouraging lecturers to start putting it as part of the actual courses. So I'm watching it and seeing what happens. We've definitely had one or two research groups that have recognized their need. Um, they were in the Python space and they started running their own internal stuff. But it is always that balance of, are we just a stopgap measure? And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. So you're just throwing that one out there as well. 
Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we have about 13 minutes remaining. Um, I actually have a question I'm going to share with the panelists that I want to invite other participants um, as well. If you would like to provide an answer to this question, um, to please raise your hand. We would love to hear from you. Um, but during your time with the Carpentries, what would you say was the most memorable experience you had? Um, what is a story you would like to share? Then I, we shared some stories at the very beginning, but um, I know that there's a there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> um, Aaron, I think this is such a wonderful question, Alicia. Thank you. I just I thought of this question, and the first thing that came to mind was at the Dublin Carpentry Con, um, the very last day, the last event everybody was just going around giving each other hugs. You know, this is pre-COVID, but like just the whole conference, 120 people, just everybody was going around hugging each other. And it was just like the most wonderful way to end a conference that I've ever attended. Thanks for sharing that, Erin. Um, Belinda. Yeah, I'd have to say Carpentry Con was a bit of a highlight. I used to have the meeting organizing it at 11 o'clock on a Friday night after having a staff meeting with Carpentries at 6 a.m. So I used to have these long, long days. But when I got to Dublin and saw how awesome Carpentry Con was, it was worth every little bit of lost sleep. Um, just a personal highlight for me, which is a brag. So here's the brag coming. Um, I got to teach library carpentry at MIT. So now I can say to people, I've taught at MIT. I've got the hat to prove it and a photo in front of the building with Julianne Schneider. We went and taught library carpentry at MIT. So for me, that was awesome. That's a great story, Belinda. Anyone else want to share a story? Um, Brian. Hello. Um, so in terms of awesome, I'm actually going to share something that's like a mixed highlight low light. And this was uh, Res Bass at Macquarie, uh, so 2018 or so. And I was running a data scraping, uh, one of the, the experimental side uh, things that not very polished um, and it just melted like it, it it went off the rails it, it was it was a really tough um, tough workshop and so so I was I was uh, we were at the debrief and and so I, I started basically talking to Daria and just the ability to get support and actually have a debrief and and go okay so this is what went wrong and here's how we can improve and and genuinely having that feedback cycle when things go wrong was very much a highlight for me because that sense of community is is fairly absent in Australian academia that's a great story Brian thanks for sharing um Carrie Here we go. So my story, a couple months into my role with Data Carpentry when I first started as an employee, I and if you've probably heard this story before, if you heard me talk about the carpentries, but I taught a workshop in Seoul with uh, Victor, um, and it was amazing. One, because it reminds me of the, the story you just shared, Belinda, about being told, yeah, you can, you know, you can teach this workshop. I had never even heard of the carpentry before I started working for data carpentry. And two months into it, I'm teaching a workshop in South Korea. And I'm going to put a link to the workshop website. I love looking at this workshop website because I have no idea what it says outside of a data carpentry workshop and then my name and the date. Everything has been translated, and it was just so amazing being a part of something so big that it it would take me all the way, you know, to South Korea. Of course, I taught my portion in English, um, but it was so great to be a part of the full experience and seeing seeing the seeing the tools, you know, taught in another, you know, language other outside of English. It was just so phenomenal. Thanks so much, Carrie, for sharing. And please read the stories to others have been sharing into the chat. This is really just wonderful. I would have to say, 
uh, one of um, my favorite memories. <laughs> Um, I started working with the Carpentries uh, in um, uh, 2021, and so I've been here for about two years now, but I have loved the first launch event that we had last month and the one today, and I know we have a few more, but I've just loved hearing all of these stories. It's just been um, so wonderful to hear um, from all of you. Um, it's just very, it's just very inspiring, um, and I think it lets us all know why, why we do this work and the importance of it. Um, I wanted to end um, with one final question um, for uh, our guest, and I know Amanda um, had to drop off, um, but uh, yeah, the 25th anniversary um, is a very, um, it's a significant achievement. Uh, it's something to be celebrated, especially by the thousands of community members who have volunteered their time um, to build it from the ground up. So we just want to um, know what is a final message you would like to share with the community before we wrap up today. Um, I'll get started with you, Liz, if that's okay. Um, I've written it down so I can be to the point. Throughout my time at the Carpentries, I've realized the importance of holding my ignorance gently. And one of the things I have learned is that learning is like jazz. You don't know you've got it until you can feel it. And you have to let go of that fear in order to play. Thank you, Liz. Um, Damien. Yeah, I mean, I. I think just reflecting on the comment is really the, the community part of it is, is, is the thing. Like, I mean, I, I feel like particularly coding is so isolating um, for people because it, it's hard to learn. It's, you know, you're constantly frustrated and, and, and just having a community to turn to, to like talk to about coding and things is, is really, I think the secret source and just, you don't necessarily know more than everyone else. Um, but you have a community that you can ask questions of and, you know, like through that you can find the answers and that's I, I think people who aren't involved in the carpentries communities don't have that secret source of the place to go and the community to lean on to figure this stuff out and I think that's that's kind of the secret source thanks Damien um, Murray um I think it's probably community um but also that the whole the eras are the pedagogy right embrace the mistakes and learn from them. Um, that'll be mine. That's great. Um, Nisha. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with community. And I think that's the most fun part of my job that I get to talk to people. I get to meet people who are within the community and they come to me with questions like, where should we go? That, that's, that's something I like because that also helps me to go hunting. Um, and that, that's, allowed me to learn a lot more than I should have about coding. I never wanted to learn this much about coding, but now I enjoy looking into it because <laughs> I never thought I would, but here I am. And that, that, that I think is all because of the carpentries. I, otherwise, I, I don't think I would have had the courage or the, or the motivation within me to go do that bit of learning. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing, Nisha. Um, Daria. Thanks. So again, to echo what everyone else has said, uh, for me, the, the last 25 years of the Carpentries overall, the last decade of my life personally, it's really been about finding the community of people who are, yes, technically very talented, but also passionate about helping and supporting others through pedagogy, through debriefs, through work. And I really, like going forward, I hope that we can continue to maintain that welcoming, open, supportive uh environment group of people really yes we're going to have new fun stuff with ai we're going to have new fun stuff with more digitalization and all this other stuff but whatever is going to happen if we can continue to maintain that sense of camaraderie of support of like really a lack of judgment a lack of and like it's an empathy and support over judgment and criticism like that's what the community is about for me because there are no like what i found the carpet there are no like we we tell people there is no stupid mistake if you don't it's fine we can work through this no matter at what level we are whether that's our first lines of code and you know you forgot to close a quote or whether we're like this workshop just melted <laughs> how, do, how do we do better next time it doesn't matter where we are in that space we all like it's a group of people who can feel safe learning together 
And if we can continue to maintain that, both locally in Australia and New Zealand and really beyond internationally, I think that that's what I'm most looking forward to seeing grow and develop. Thank you um, so much, Daria, and just thank you, everyone. Um, in just these final few minutes, I just want to end by um, sharing my gratitude with all of you. Um, thanks to our guests for being with us today, um, to everyone who attended, um, and to all of our community members around the globe. Um, you are all at the heart of what makes this community so special, um, and I just cannot wait to see what we are all able to accomplish together in the years to come. Um, so thank you, thank you, and a, a big round of applause <laughs> for everyone. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, um, no matter where you are in the world, and that we will be together again soon in a virtual or in-person space, wherever that may be. <laughs> thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Elijah.